There we go. You could have chosen to stay home tonight. And so you chose to come to church. And because of that, there's been a special touch of the Spirit of God here tonight. The Lord is, there's an undercurrent. If you haven't felt it yet, it's here. And it is the Spirit of God. There's one more praise left in this house. If you want to praise God right now, just clap your hands or raise your hands and love the Lord right now. I love you, Jesus. I worship you. I praise you, God. I magnify your holy name, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for what you did for us at Calvary. For the empty tomb, God, I give you praise and glory and honor. And I magnify your name, Jesus. I magnify your name, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. How many want to be in the center of God's will tonight? What a beautiful song, Brother Finney. It's good to be here. Good to be with the bishop and Sister Harper and to be with you. Turn to somebody and say, my, how you look good tonight. My wife looks good tonight. Praise God. I have friends here that I'm happy are here tonight. Thank you for being here. Matthew chapter 26, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to preach tonight the Christ, the chosen, the crucified. The Christ, the chosen, the crucified. It came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. In this passage, we see the Christ. In this passage, we see the chosen, his disciples. And then we know that he's going to be crucified. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, I love you. I thank you for your people that are here, Jesus, and for your presence that we feel right now. Lord, we just want you to have your way in this service tonight. We just, Lord, want to have a word that will go into someone's heart. They'll receive it as it is the word of God and their life will be changed. Lord, I'm speaking in the situations tonight where there's no peace, but you're the God of peace. Speaking in the situation, God, where there's fear, God, but you're the God who cast out fear with your perfect love. And we speak it in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said in Jesus' name. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 34, 11 to 12 and verse 16, he tells us something very interesting. He says, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away, will bind up that which is broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a prophet in the Old Testament. He's also a priest. He was supposed to have been a priest. He was raised to be a priest. And at the age of 15 or 20, depending on who you're reading, here comes Nebuchadnezzar and he takes the children of Judah away into Babylonian captivity. And when he does, he takes this young man, this boy, if you will, who was destined to be a priest of the Most High God and he puts him into a place of exile, away from Jerusalem. He was told by God in visions what the Lord would do to bring judgment upon the people of Judah. And yet, he was not allowed to say a word about it. He was supposed to be mute and say nothing. In fact, his wife died. His wife died, and when she died, he was not allowed to even mourn 
her loss. I don't know about you tonight, but if my wife passed away suddenly, I would be grief stricken. I would not know what to do with myself. I would not know who to talk to. In fact, I would want to tell everybody, listen, would you please pray for me? My wife is gone and I don't know how I'm going to make it. I'm grief stricken because she's gone. And yet here we see that the Lord tells Ezekiel, do not grieve for your lost wife. She's dead. Don't grieve for her. It seemed very cold hearted for the Lord to do this to Ezekiel, but it was a sign of what the Lord was doing. You see, sometimes we do things to protect ourselves. The Lord had to keep firm in his judgment of Judah, and he was telling Ezekiel, you're going to not mourn them because you're going to show these people that I'm not going to mourn them. But I want you to know that that is not true of God. God mourns every lost soul. Everyone who wavers and walks away, he grieves for them to come back to him because all souls are God's the Bible says a soul that sitteth it shall surely die but do not think it is a small thing for a soul to die and be lost and on its way to hell so here's Ezekiel Ezekiel is dying or he's grieving he is not able to say a word he's mute in fact, the Lord tells him to do several interesting things. He's not supposed to say a word, but he's supposed to act out some things that are going to happen. Have you ever known something and you just wanted to tell everybody and you weren't allowed to tell nobody? This was what happened to Ezekiel. He was supposed to hold this in. He could act it out, but that would be confusing. It would be almost like a parable. And so here he was trying to do what the Lord told him, trying to somehow show these signs of what God was judging the people with. And in the midst of all that, he comes up in the end of Ezekiel with this, this fabulous verse about a coming Messiah. It is an absolutely oneness view of the coming Messiah because he says, Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. God did not send some Jehovah Junior to come his way and save us. God did not send some other proxy in his place to come. But Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, came unto his own to receive them and to seek them and to find them. He is the good shepherd who goes out to seek his own sheep. He's not seeking somebody else to do the job for him. Uh, he says, I will seek that which was lost and bring them again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick but I will destroy the fat and the strong and I will feed them with judgment I will seek that which was lost. it reminds me of what he said in the book of Luke when, Luke, when he quote, read from the scroll of Isaiah he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he hath sent me to heal the broken hearted to preach deliverance of the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he goes on in chapter 37 and talks about David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statues and do them, and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever." My servant David shall be their prince. For David, it is a messianic prophecy because only Jesus Christ is, gonna, is the one that's going to live forever sitting upon the throne of David. God manifests in the flesh. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. It was this Christ, this Messiah, this one true God in flesh that gave himself on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. He hung his head and he died. When we celebrate Easter because three days later he rose up from the grave. The old, I'm hearing an old black preacher I heard years ago Bishop James Johnson said he rose up from the grave. He rose triumphant as he said, snatched the victory from the grave. Rose again our souls to save. 
Oh, glory. Hallelujah to the Lamb. The Lamb deserves your hallelujahs right now. Just hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. There's only one worthy to take the scroll, and it was the Lamb that was set upon that throne. Only one worthy, and the only one that will ever be worthy is Jesus tonight. Jesus is worthy of every praise you can offer. Jesus is ever worthy of every sacrifice you can give. Jesus is worthy of every price that he ever asked you to give. And tonight is a good night to reevaluate your life and say, you know what, I need to make some consecrations once again. And say, Jesus, I'm going to give this back to you. Amen. Henceforth, he, I call you not servants, he said. That was the Christ, Jesus Christ. The chosen is a different thing because we have been chosen. Jesus said, For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You tonight are the chosen. He was with his disciples, Jesus, when he said they're going to betray me and they're going to crucify me. Uh, and he also said another place you're going to have in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Yeah. But don't worry about it. I've overcome the world. Think it not strange, these fiery trials that come upon you. Wow. There's going to be some days where you're weary in your body, weary in your mind, low in spirit. And the dreams that you held on to, you think they're going to fail. I want you to know God does not fail you. God will not fail you. He says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. He is here right now to take you up under his wings and to hold on to you. He wants to let you know that you are in the hollow of his hand. And if you're in the Father's hand, no man can pluck you out. Nobody can take you because you've been chosen by God. He said, I've chosen you and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. You live far below your position in Christ tonight. You live far below where you could be in him. When is the last time you asked him for something not, and expected him to truly give it to you? Tonight's a good night to call out that thing that you've been holding on to. You wonder if, if I just prayed for this, would God really give this to me? You'll never know unless you ask him. These things I command you that you love one another. Learn to somebody to say, I love you. Amen. I love you. I love you. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated. That's what it means to be chosen by God, Brother Finney. We're going to suffer some things in life. Uh, they hated him. They destroyed him. One day he even was walking over and saw the city of Jerusalem and he stopped. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that killed the prophets, how oft I would have gathered you to myself like a chicken or a hen did its brood, but you would not. You kept on running away. You kept on trying to deny me. And I've come to know that in the choosing, there comes a time of sifting. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. There's a great poem I like to read from time to time. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man. When God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part. When he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed. Watch his methods. Watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects how he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which only God understands. While his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him but every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. God knows what he is doing in your life. You may not know what he's doing in your life, but God knows what he's doing 
in your life. God has it all figured out. You just need to lean on him. Like the old song says, I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. I'm finding more power than I ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. <laughs> Just raise your hand right now and love him. I love you, Jesus. I lean on you, Jesus. I lean on you, Jesus. I lean on you. Because you're chosen, that means there's going to be some times in which you're going to be disappointed in those around you because they're going to disappoint you. Your present struggles, however, they await a perfected future, a completed future that God has in store for you, and God knows what he's about. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. Uh, you don't have to be rich to be chosen by the Lord. You just need to be poor. And I'm not talking about monetarily poor tonight, but you need to be poor in the spirit. God resisteth the proud, the Bible says, but he gives grace to the humble he hates pride. He says, a broken and a contrite spirit, O oh God, thou wilt not despise chosen. But you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. You are a chosen a generation. And who knows? You might be the generation upon whom the ends of the world have come. And he had chosen you. If this is the case, and we believe it to be so, that God is coming soon, then he chose a long time ago for you to be alive right now at this age and in this time and entrusted you with the gospel so that you could be a witness of his divine power, his love, and his grace and show that into the lives of other people. These shall make war with the Lamb. The Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Many are called, the Bible says, but few are chosen. And it's not because when He called them, He automatically assumed He wouldn't choose them. It's because you have decisions that you have to make in life that either qualify you as not just called, but also chosen. And I don't know what decision it is that you've been putting off. I, I don't know what it is that gets in the way of your head and of your thinking. I, I wish I could sometimes get into people's brains, Brother Harper, and just pull that thing out. But I can't do that for you. Well, I can pray for you. I can seek God for you. I can try to talk with you about it. But, but really, you've got to let God come into your heart. and You've got to let him do some work in there, some surgery, and, and change things around in your mind so that you get right thinking again. Because he has chosen you. But you have to choose him as well. You have to say, okay, I'm going to go with the choice here. He chose me, so I'm going to go with him. See, Jesus fulfills many things in the Passover. There was this crucifixion that we talked about last week on Children's Day and today. The lamb had to be a first year. And Jesus was the firstborn of Mary and of the Lord. The lamb must be a male from the flock, and Jesus was born a male like his brethren. And I'm still glad I know the difference between male and female. Amen. The lamb must be without spot or blemish. Jesus had no sin, no inherent or acquired defect. The book of Leviticus talks about that the priest could not have any defects. 
no broken bones, no blemishes whatsoever. It was because those priests were a type of the of Christ that was to come, who was supposed to be our great high priest to deliver us from all sin. And he could only do that if he was out blemished. I'm thankful tonight that we serve an unblemished Savior who has no sin whatsoever. And he took upon our sin and so that we could be saved and our sins could be washed and covered by his blood. The Bible says, out the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. When he sees a lamb, the Bible says, when the Lord sees it, when I see the lamb, I'll pass over you. The lamb is for God. When I see the blood, I'm sorry, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. I almost forgot my Sunday school lesson. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. The blood is for God. He sees the blood upon the doorpost. He sees the blood upon you when you were baptized in his name. He says, I'll pass over you. But he says the lamb is for the house. The lamb is for you. Jesus is for you this evening. So here he is. You've got to raise that thing. You've got to love on it. You get it. Your kids are going to give it a name. You're going to get close to it. And then you've got to slay it. You've got to wipe its blood upon the doorpost. And then you've got to eat it and roast it. Listen, you need to take in every bit of Jesus that you can. We practice the ordinance. We obey the ordinance of Jesus Christ of communion, which is that we take his body, which was broken for us. That's the bread. We take the blood that was shed for us. That's his Holy Spirit. That's what he covers us with. And tonight, Jesus is here right now to give you new life if you will trust him and give it to him. So the door had to have blood on it, and Jesus' blood has to be applied in your life. The lamb had to be eaten, and so Jesus ate the Passover meal and gave us the ordinance. The lamb's bones were not to be broken, and Jesus died before they could break his bones at Calvary. They didn't break his legs. They plushed a spear into his side and blood and water flow, which is a type of the church that came out of him. And then also the Passover was to be accompanied by seven days of unleavened bread. And Jesus calls everybody everywhere to repent and to separate themselves from sin. I don't know what you have done tonight. I don't know how far you strayed from God, but I know that we serve a crucified Christ who died for the sins of everybody. Every man, every woman, every child, every girl, everybody has got an option to come to Jesus if they want to come to him but he is crucified. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Everybody in this room can be healed tonight if you ever recognize who you are in Jesus Christ and what he has prepared for you. You have to have faith in what he can do. So Romans 6, 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Our old man is crucified with him. That this body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Once he was crucified, I also allowed my old man to be crucified so that I no longer have to be servant of sin. You don't have to serve sin any longer. Quit allowing sin to spoil your house. Quit allowing sin to destroy you and your relationships and your closeness and your proximity. Let God reach into your heart and change that stony heart and give you a new heart tonight because God loves you. He died for you. He was crucified for you. Paul wrote in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. You thought it was just Christ at Calvary? No. You were crucified with Christ. That old man was put to death. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He loves me. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and just tell him, did you know Jesus loves you? Did you know Jesus loves you? And then Jesus said in Matthew 10, He that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. There's something about taking up your cross daily and following him. Then said Jesus to the disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You need to learn to follow Jesus. You, I know you said, well, I started out a long time ago, but sometimes we get sidetracked. We get hurt. We get angry. We get bitter. We become hardened. The songs that we used 
to weep to when we heard them sung in the church house we no longer weep to. The songs we used to rejoice over we no longer rejoice over because we have become used to what we have. I want to tell you tonight, never ever forget the pit from which God dragged you from. Don't ever forget where you were when He pulled you up. He, the Bible, another song says, He set my feet on a rock to stay. He pulled me up out of the miry clay. Today is a good day for you to get up out of the muck and the mire of sin and allow the risen Savior to touch your heart again. Ezekiel started out his ministry. It was when the Lord spoke to him the first time and told him, this is what I want you to do, Ezekiel. And it that might seem like it's a coincidence, but there's no coincidences in God because the young man was 30 years old when the Lord first spoke to him and gave him that first vision, that first command. That was the age in which a priest would begin to work in the temple. There is no temple, mind you. Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple's destroyed. And here is Ezekiel in a strange land. He is by the river Kibar. And he's thinking, you know, uh, what am I going to do here? Yet the God of heaven calls him. Yahweh speaks to him and says, you're going to be a prophet and this is what you're going to do. And he begins to work in that ministry. And then for the next 20 years, he's 30 and 20 years he ministers. 20 years he prophesies. 20 years he does what the Lord tells him to do. And then the Lord gives him this great, great prophecy. He says, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. The Christ, the chosen, the crucified. And then there's also those tonight who have new hearts. Oh, we talked about the pure heart of Brother Finney. I've been with him. I've talked with him. I've sensed it. I've met other men who had the same thing. There's something about the trials of life that drive things out of you that did not need to be in you and you're replaced with the pureness. It is called the anointing. The anointing is not getting up and spitting on people while you're preaching. That's not what the anointing is. There's something about when they begin to crush them olives. They crush them olives up to a certain point and then they stop because they know that if we crush the seed, then the olive oil becomes bitter. And so the Lord works on people. He allows His chosen to go through some things. He wasn't bitter. He was on the cross being crucified. And a a, a thief says to Him, Would you just remember me? After all this, and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. He could have taken a moment of extreme pain, of extreme measures, and say that thief, who do you think you are talking to me right now? But he did not do that. He took a moment of horror. He took a moment of pain and of self-destruction he was going through, and he turned it into a moment of mercy to somebody else and allowed him to have mercy and grace outside of a time in which he should have because God is a merciful God. He will reach into your life. And this is what he does here in this passage. He says, I am going to give you a new heart. The Old Testament said, yeah, something different. He had to offer animals and bollocks, bullocks and all that for your sacrifices, for your sins. He said, no, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to put it within you. This spirit that we have today is the spirit of the Holy Ghost. God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and He wants to keep you full of the Holy Ghost. It's not just enough to speak in tongues one time in your life. You need to be full of the Holy Ghost. Now don't get me wrong. And now I begin to walk off my notes here. Don't get me wrong when I say this. Speaking in tongues is not the Holy Ghost. It is the sign that you have the Holy Ghost. I don't have the Holy Ghost because I speak in tongues. I speak in tongues because I have the Holy Ghost. What really lasts here is do I allow the fruit of the Spirit to manifest in my life? That's the guide by which one truly has the Spirit of God in them. Do you have love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance? Those are the things that God is looking for. That means I have to have patience with you. 
when I as a chosen of God suffer at your hands. That means I have to show you mercy when I don't really want to show you mercy. There will be people that will never come to you and say, listen, I'm sorry. The Bible said he came unto his own, and his own received him not, but to many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. They were born not in the flesh, but they're born of the Spirit. Tonight is your night to lay aside those weights and those things you've been holding on to. Allow God to create within you a new heart. Allow Him to create within you a new spirit. Put it within you and take that stony heart of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Don't harden your heart. You know what happens to those who harden hardens their hearts. I'm closing now. You know what happens to those whose hearts are hardened. But he says, I'll put my spirit within you. I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. It's awful hard sometimes to do those things. But if you'll just give your heart to the Lord tonight. And you say, well, you're preaching to a room full of believers. I know I am. I know I am. But I've been living for the Lord long enough to know that if you have the Holy Ghost five years or ten years or twenty or thirty, you can still grow cold. And what a wonderful time of the year right now. We're celebrating the resurrected Savior who gave all so that we might have all. It'd just be a good time to Stand with me right now. Raise your hands. And just love the Lord as Brother Finney sings this song right now. tonight somebody just find a place to pray the Lord change me I've got some things I've been going through
I need thee. 